I can still remember, it must have been 1986, turning the television news off and turning to my wife and saying, I am sick and tired of hearing about AIDS. It was shortly after that that the Lord began to break my heart for people with HIV. I received a telephone call from a woman in our church whose brother was in the hospital. Now, I knew this guy. He had accepted the Lord in our church. One Sunday, he had come down to visit her. Uh, he had gotten involved in a church in Los Angeles, which is about 50 miles away from us, so he didn't attend our church too often. But he was growing as a Christian. Uh, almost a year went by. He called and said, could you perform my we wedding? I'm getting married. I've met a Christian girl. I said, great. And now, a year after that, I, I received this call, and she said, Kurt's in the hospital, and he's got AIDS. I said, what? And actually those words that I had said to my wife came ringing back into my ears and, and I, uh, I said, well, how did he get AIDS? And she said, well, he's a, he was a secret drug user and a drug addict before he gave his life to the Lord and I didn't even know that. And so I went to visit him and as I walked into the hospital to visit him, and at that time you had to wear gloves and a mask and, and you had to, there was all this stuff that you had to put on. And I didn't know that, I, I just walked into the room and I noticed his IV had come out of his arm. And I looked at him and here's a man that I knew. He was strapped into the bed, he couldn't move. Uh, I mean, he, he couldn't not move, he was in convulsions of some sort. <clears throat> and the IV had come out of his arm, there was blood all over his arm and on his bed and my heart broke for him. And I went immediately over and started cleaning up his arm and wiping the blood off and the nurse came in, she saw that I was there and she about had a heart attack right there and made me step out and put on the gloves and the mask and the gown and all of this and she cleaned him up and I went back in, sat down and I talked to him for 20 minutes. The problem was he couldn't talk but I didn't know if he could understand if it was me or even understand my words and so I asked him, I said, Kurt, it's Bruce, if you can understand me, blink your eyes once and he blinked his eyes. Now remember, his body's in, stra he's strapped into his bed, his body's moving like this the whole time, and he blinked his eyes. And I realized that he could hear me. And so for the next 20 minutes, I had a conversation with him. And one blink was yes, and two blinks were no. And I found out that uh, his wife was very upset with him. She had been tested and she found out she was HIV positive. It was just a heartbreaking situation, and he had been in the hospital nine days. I looked at him and I said, Kurt, are you ready to go be with the Lord because you're not going to live very much longer? And he blinked his eyes one time. Yes, he was. I prayed with him, and shortly after that he died. And again, my heart was broken for that man. There was somebody I knew. As long as it was on television, I didn't know anybody. But when it came into my heart, my life, wow. Shortly after that, I... I had a knock on my door. It was a, a young man that I'd seen in church once or twice. I knew his parents very well. They were members of our church. And I knew he wasn't a Christian. He was 21, 22 years of age. And he said, uh, Bruce, can I talk to you? I said, sure. So he came in and sat down. And I said, what's going on? He said, uh, I don't know how to tell something to my parents. I don't know how to communicate something to them. And I need your help. I said, OK, what is it? And he said, well, I've been living in Hollywood, working in the film industry, and I've been living with a man in a homosexual relationship. And the man I've been living with just died, and I just did his funeral last week. He died of HIV and AIDS. And he said, and I found out I'm HIV positive, and I don't know what to tell my parents. I don't know what to do. And so we talked for a couple of hours then, and that day he prayed and accepted the Lord. And I'm glad to say that uh, probably two months later, after we talked through a lot of things and worked through things, we called his parents into the office and we met there and he shared and opened his heart to them. And they wept and hugged him and loved him and cared for them for the next 20, almost 20 years until he went to be with the Lord. That too, though, broke my heart. Here was somebody, again, I knew. 
Not too long after that, uh, two guys from the Orange County Rescue Mission who were members of our church. They had gone from the streets, you being drug addicts, to going into this program through the Orange County Rescue Mission. They came to our church and had become part of the church in this New Life program. And it was really good because Irvine, where I had started the village church of Irvine, this is a, a yuppie community. And you have these kind of well-to-do people and very uh, together Christians and sitting next to them are these guys right off the streets who had given their lives to the Lord but were still struggling with a lot of issues too. And it was an excellent combination of people for, for a church and it was healthy and we were a growing church. But these two guys had to be tested <clears throat> for the program they were in and they both found out they were HIV positive. And so they didn't know what to do and they met me one Sunday after the service and said, Bruce, can we talk to you? We need to talk to you about something. And I said, sure. And they said, we're, we're both HIV positive uh, and we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. Well, there are no Christian groups around. And so out of that, uh, we began meeting and a support group for Christians living with HIV and AIDS. And it was a, a new start. It was a wonderful new journey that all three of us didn't know what we were going to learn through. It uh, wasn't long before I, I had a radio program at that time uh, on the local Orange County station, and I announced that we were meeting and inviting any Christian with HIV and AIDS to come. And we started getting calls and people coming in. It was a young man by the name of Herb Hall came, and uh, he was uh, an angry young man, full of a lot of frustration, angry because he had lived in a homosexual life for 10 years, had stepped out of that life in his commitment to the Lord, had met a young woman, and they wanted to get married. And, but he thought, I better be tested for HIV. He was tested and he had full-blown AIDS. And so he was frustrated and angry and angry at himself and angry at God. And, and we began to work through that. And after about a year or a year and a half, we really began the ministry of He and His Victory. Herb really had grown and matured a lot and had let go of a lot of that anger. And uh, others had come in. Mike Hilton was a hemophiliac. Uh, he had 22 different diseases from the blood products that he had to take for his life for his existence. One of those diseases that he had accumulated through, from those blood products was HIV. Uh, Tamara Brown, she was a young mother, a Christian, who had been married nine years, had a little boy, Joshua, and Tamara uh, had seen a television program about HIV and thought, maybe I should be tested from the way I used to live. And she was tested and found out she was HIV positive. Her husband and her son were not. And so the, th the three of them and myself really then formulated this ministry called He Intends Victory from that support group that was started uh, two years previous. Herb was a big one uh, because he had been a homosexual and lived in the life. Uh, he was a big spokesperson to, to many in that community. And he would go to many of the meetings and groups and he would talk about being a former homosexual. That was very hard for some people to see or, or to accept. Uh, there were people who said, well, you were never a homosexual. And he would say, wait a minute, I got AIDS from this. And I'm, I lived there for 10 years. Don't tell me what I was and what I wasn't. But he says, I just want everyone to know that whether you're a homosexual or not, Jesus loves you. And he loves me and he's forgiven me of my sins and I'm going forward in that. And that really was very powerful. Uh, he had a, a wonderful testimony of the power of Jesus all the way through his, until his death in 2003. And so I've seen, as I said, many people who have lived in the homosexual life come out and no longer live there, but be free of that. That doesn't mean there aren't temptations along the way. It doesn't mean that they don't have certain uh, desires that arise up or feelings, but they've learned I mean, I don't act on all of my feelings either. I'm glad that the Lord has helped me to say no to some of the things that I might desire that aren't the best for me. Uh, so we learn how to walk by His Spirit and it takes time and love and grace to do that. Our goal is to encourage those with HIV to see that there is hope in Jesus Christ. The hope that we offer doesn't stop when they die. Uh, yes, the person with HIV often thinks, 
I'm going to die this week. But even if they think, come to realize, well, I'm going to live another year or two or five. Maybe I'll live another 20 or 30 years. In 30 years, they're going to die. Uh, even Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, Jesus raised him from the dead, died again. Uh, but Jesus gives us hope for eternity. What happens to us after we die? That's what really makes the difference. And so we start with today and work with them to tomorrow and then hopefully encourage them through Jesus into eternity. We provide uh, HIV positive encouragers, others who have come through that place of recognizing that the Lord has a purpose for your life, that even when you find out you're HIV positive, your life isn't over, there's value to you and there's value to your life, and, and God has a plan for your life. And so as people come to that place of realization, then we surround them with others so that they can kind of mentor and help them through that process. It makes a lot of difference when you know you're not alone, uh, and when you know you're not even alone and Jesus is standing before you, you got others who understand around you. Uganda has a program called the ABCs. Uh, the president of the country, uh, his name is Joseph Museveni, and his wife Janet, Janet Museveni, who's a wonderful Christian woman, came up with a program, a very simple program, to help the people of their country understand that HIV will kill you and that there are ways to prevent being infected. And that the primary way is A, to abstain. Abstain from having sex outside of marriage. Abstain from having sex with those who are HIV positive. And if you'll do that, you'll be safe from being infected. B, be faithful, faithful to your spouse, faithful to that person who you love and care for and have sex with, be faithful. If you do that, if you're faithful, you're less likely to be infected with HIV. And C, condoms, use condoms when appropriate. Now, a lot of groups don't like to use that last part, when appropriate, but in Uganda especially, which is considered a Christian nation or a nation of Christians, uh, Uganda wants to promote the idea of faithfulness in marriage. So they're recommending using a condom in a marriage where one is HIV positive and one is not. Now that program has been used for probably 12 years now, 10 years now, and they've seen the rate of infection drop from 17% down to about 6%. So it's been very effective in Uganda and in Kenya now and in some other countries of Africa. Of course, there's a strong push from others who say condoms only. They want only C, only C. The, the weakness of that is, is that, uh, you know, people are very vulnerable, especially women in Africa especially in countries like Uganda where a woman has no say, a wife has no say. If a husband wants to have sex, she must have sex with him. He can be brutal with her, he can beat her. Even in the church, it's tolerated that a Christian husband can beat his wife. So one of the things we do when we go to Uganda and other countries is to promote a true marriage relationship and love as the component in a relationship and that Jesus would never beat a wife and that Jesus would never abuse a sexual relationship. Uh, in the country of Kenya, we do AIDS education in the schools. So we may speak to 100,000 students who have come from homes and environments where they're taught that a man can beat his wife. But we teach them that it's not God's way. That's not what Jesus would do. And we're seeing a real result in Kenya and other countries as well. But it's a big challenge and there's a lot to it. It gets complex. But uh, the simple answer is Jesus can change us and give us new lives and new purpose. So HIV is a big problem in the world yet. 33, over 33 million people are infected with HIV. Since it was uh, discovered in, in the early 80s, another 25 million people have already died. Every year, about 2.2 million people die of HIV infection throughout the world. But about 2.5 million are infected. Uh, there are 12 million children who are AIDS orphans. So it's this huge problem that keeps growing and growing, and uh, I guess that's why they call it a pandemic. It's all over the world. Your 
The name of our ministry is He Intends Victory, H-I-V. And we're a Christian ministry to those infected and affected by HIV and AIDS. Today we're in 21 countries of the world. We provide educational material, we provide uh, encouragement, we provide care. Uh, we have homes for women who are HIV positive and their children. We have a number of homes in Malaysia. We built a home for children who are HIV positive in Thailand. We've had orphanages in, in Uganda. We have an AIDS orphan child sponsorship program. We have thousands of AIDS orphans who are looking for sponsors who need someone to care for them. We have AIDS widows programs. Uh, we have over a hundred support groups around the world. So we welcome people to contact us at www.heintensvictory.com uh, and in the United States you can get hold of us at 1-800-HIV-HOPE. Because we've had so much HIV education in the United States, everybody learns about it in school, everyone hears about it on television, we have this mentality that HIV is just a chronic disease. Yet, there are as many people infected today with HIV in the United States as there were 15 years ago in the United States. So today, 57, this year, 57,000 people will become infected with HIV, most of them thinking, I'll never get it. Half of them not even knowing they are HIV positive until they've probably already passed it on to somebody else. So it's still a very big disease, very pro big problem in the US. Now in other countries like Uganda, and in Kenya or in Vietnam, where we work, these countries are very aware that HIV is destructive uh, to the point that it hurts your country. Uh, in Uganda, we have numerous villages that we work with where the only ones really alive are the grandparents and the children. The moms and, fa the moms and dads have all died, and so the grandparents are caring for these children. Uh, we were just in Uganda not too long ago, and this young man came up to us who is 18 years of age. Both of his brothers and their wives have died, and he inherited, at the age of 18, 13 children. He cares for 13 kids. What does that, ha what does that mean? It means that he can't get his crop in. He, it means that he can only work part of his field, because they're all s small children. He's got to care for them. So he's now only raising enough crop to feed his children. He can't raise quite enough to sell to buy other things. So it devastates an economy. It devastates the resources of a country when they're struggling to buy HIV medication to pass it on to, their, to their, uh, uh, peop the people in their country. So it has this terrible effect and continues to around the world. But in, in many countries of the world, HIV has not been taught. Uh, again, in Uganda, where we just were, the rumor that's going around, the, the myth is, if you don't, as a man, if you don't want to get HIV, then have sex with another man, and you won't become positive. Now, a few years ago, the rumor that was going around was, if you're HIV positive, the way to be cured is to have sex with a virgin. And so young girls were being raped, and young girls who were virgins at younger and younger ages were being horribly abused because of this myth going around and the desperation of guys who are HIV positive thinking I can be cured if I just rape this girl. And it's very sad. So part of what we do in every country is to provide adequate and honest and true education. The fastest growing infection group in the United States now are uh, girls um, 15 to 29 years of age from the minority community. Washington DC has an uh, 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 infection rate which is almost triple what it is in the rest of the country and equal to what it is in some parts of South Africa. I think there's a truth to this idea that uh, amongst young gay guys that, well, I was born this way, I'm going to always be this way, there's nothing I can do to change my life, and HIV is a part of gay life now. It's just part of life. 
And so there's almost this uh, resignation to HIV. It's very sad. You don't have to be HIV positive. We keep telling people that. You don't have to be. Take, take charge of your own body. It's a hard message to get across though, because at the same time we're saying these types of things, there's this message that comes from the large community that says you're always going to be this way. You were born this way. You have to live this way. As Christians, we believe in the healing power of the Holy Spirit in lives. Um, but I found in Africa especially, um, there are some people who believe they're HIV positive that aren't. Um, if you travel throughout Africa, you'll find that everybody says they have malaria. We use the term, I've got the flu. They use the term, I've got malaria. Now it's not necessarily real malaria, it's uh, the fact that they're sick. And when people get malaria in that way, sometimes they know that they've done something they were not supposed to do, and therefore they have HIV. They've never been tested. So we encourage people to be tested. It's well worth knowing your status, if you're HIV positive or not. Sometimes we've seen that some of these people who claim that they've had a healing actually were never HIV positive. So what we do is we encourage those who say, I've been healed, to go back to the doctor, to make sure they've had a test ahead of time or there are some way to verify they were HIV positive in the beginning. And then to be tested not only once but a number of times after that over a period of time and to verify their healing. The reason being is that it's very easy in some ways to say, I've been healed. And then you disappear and kind of go off and you die from HIV infection. But it's much more difficult to say, I've been healed and here's the evidence of it. That's far more powerful and it certainly doesn't give the world a way then to point fingers and say, see, you guys aren't really healed anyway. We've recognized that we're not the physician. We're not the healer. Jesus is the healer when it comes to praying for someone to be healed. So we often will ask the Lord to touch them, to encourage them, to give them strength, uh, to heal them. But it's up to him to do that. It's not up to me and it's not up, I think it's not really even up to that person unless they've received a word of faith from the Lord. Uh, so that's kind of a, a, a challenge and a balance. But um, we, we do pray for them to be healed. When it comes to being healed, I know of three people who have actually been able to verify that they were HIV positive, that in some form the, the Lord healed them, in some way somebody prayed for them and they were healed, and now they are not HIV positive. Uh, but it's, I think it's fewer and farther than what we think. And really, I don't know anybody who dies healthy. I mean, everybody dies of something, whether you're 80 or 16 or 22, whether you're HIV positive or not. Uh, everybody dies, uh, uh, and, and we're all looking for the Lord to come, but I think dying is part of the process of life here on earth. And the day will come when that'll all cease, and Jesus will come back, and we're gonna, we're gonna live in that eternal life forever, which we've begun spiritually now. But I think that uh, dying isn't the worst thing that happens to people. The worst thing that happens is not to know who the Lord Jesus is and the grace that God offers and the freedom that he brings to someone who may be HIV positive or may not be. If someone is interested in contacting us, they can get hold of us at www.heintendsvictory. That's very simple, heintendsvictory.com. And we have free information packets. We send them all over the world. We have a book called In His Shadow is a, a devotional for Christians living with HIV and AIDS, written by a woman who's HIV positive herself. And uh, in uh, another book that we have is He Intends Victory, real life stories of Christians living with HIV and AIDS. So we welcome people to contact us at www.heintendsvictory.com. Uh, and, and call us at, in the United States, you can get hold of us at 1-800-HIV-HOPE. Uh, if you go online, you can see what countries we're in. We have country directors in all of our countries. We have workers there. We have lots that go on. We're glad to help and we're glad to be there.